All right. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Pathway. We had a little bit of technical difficulty up here, but I think we've got it figured out. Can you all hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Can you hear the guitar okay out there? Yeah? Awesome. All right. Well, welcome to, ch welcome to chapel. Um, we're going to get started this morning with worship. I'm Kayla, and uh, my band is, well, they're they're on leave or TDY or whatever, so it's just me today, but we're going to have fun uh, worshiping and singing, and we're just going to have a great time. So why don't you stand with us? We're going to sing Friend of God, and um, the Bible tells us in Proverbs that there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother, and that is our Savior, our, G our, our Lord, Jesus Christ. He sticks closer. If you've got a friend, then you know he's going to have your back. And I, I'm so thankful that I have a friend like that in God. So let's, um, let's sing together. Who am I that you are mindful of me? And you can clap to this song if you let <laughs> you hear me. If you want to. When I call, because I'm not a drummer today, so you have to be my drummers. Is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me? It's amazing. Oh, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Who am I that you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call? Is it true that you are thinking of me, how you love me? It's amazing. I am a friend. God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Oh, I am a friend of God. And I am a friend of God. Oh, I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. God. And you guys can have a seat if you have announcements. Hey, good morning, Pathway. Uh, I'm Jim Harbridge. I am your local Officers Christian Fellowship rep here in the area, and I really want to welcome you to Pathway this morning. We're excited that you're here with us. Uh, and invite you, uh, or just remind you that we're continuing our sermon series, uh, God Saves, the story of us. We'll continue this for a couple of weeks. Okay, let's talk about VBS. We've got VBS is coming up 3 to 5 August, and it's going to look a lot different this year. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be in our neighborhoods, so six different parks in the neighborhood will have VBS out there. Uh, there's more details uh, in, the, in, the bullet, or in the flyers. 
But I do want to say to it's it's new, but it's going to require uh, some help. So if you would be interested in helping us volunteer for that, please reach out to Carl Tillery and let him know. Uh, just a lot of places that we're going to need coverage on. With that, uh, Pathway Community uh, is a community, uh, but in all honesty, we're rebuilding after COVID, and we uh, to make it. Uh, what it can be and make it even better. We'd like to invite you to be a part of our community and serve the community in a way that you're comfortable with and you're gifted with. There's a, a lot of options that uh, that we could use your help with. Child care, children's church, greeters and ushers, making people feel welcome as they come in, uh, and even uh, tech support. Uh, if you're interested in that, uh, please see Chaplain Kelly or uh, Carl Tiller as well to help you get connected. Do want to let you know we've got two Sunday school classes Details are, are in the slides, but uh, those start at 945, both of them in this building. I want to invite you to Officers Christian Fellowship's Discipleship Training Breakfast. Uh, we're starting up a four-week summer series this Tuesday. It's 0600 in the courtyard on the east side of Pioneer Chapel, which is, if you're new, is the chapel down the hill, just down the hill from us. Um, so an hour-long Bible study followed by breakfast. This is not a men's study. This is for everybody. I invite you. I hope to see you on Tuesday morning. Uh, I'd like to invite you to go to our Facebook page at Pathways FLKS. That's where you can find sort of all of the details for these. You can find these slides. You can find a little better description of who we are and what we're trying to do here at Pathway. Uh, and we'd just like you to like and follow that page so you can keep up to date. And finally, I want to remind you some other awesome um, ministry events that are occurring here. The Men of the Chapel uh, meets at 0600 on Thursday mornings inside of Pioneer Chapel, which is downstairs, like I said, down the hill, 0600. And then also Protestant Women of the Chapel uh, is meeting again this year, and there's a lot of volunteer opportunities there too. They've got room on their leadership board. Uh, they, they need help with leading studies, but uh, don't miss an opportunity to be a part of both of those uh, great groups. Uh, they can help you be connected and help you grow while you're here this year. Uh, we're so glad you're here. Welcome. Have a great week. Man, good morning. We are glad that you're ever all here. It uh, it's kind of does the heart good to, to look out and there's people sitting here together in the house of the Lord. Uh, and we're so excited you're here. Despite what it looks like, it's not the same shirt I had on in the video. Promise you it's a different one. I just didn't plan it out very well today. But um, hey, welcome Welcome, welcome. If it's your first time here, we're so excited you're here. If it's your hundredth time here, we're excited that you're here. Uh, if you would, please uh, take uh, just a couple minutes to get up and greet somebody around you that you don't know yet. Uh, if you're into it, give them a hug and tell them hello. And if you're not there yet, wave from a distance and tell them hello. Thanks so much. Hey, it's okay, you can get up. so glad that we are getting to know each other and hugging necks and shaking hands and having conversations. But as you make your way back to your seats, shake a couple more hands, hug a couple more necks. We're going to continue on with worship this morning. Um, we just moved yesterday, actually, <laughs> but I'm still close enough where I can come back every week and be here. So, um, 
But going through a move, going through PCS, going through transitions, going through things in your life. In fact, I'm going through something in our family that's just very personal, that's very hard. And I know that this is going to be a, uh, a marathon, not a sprint. Um, but in the process, you know, you fight all the, the negative feelings or the negative thoughts that come in and things that the enemy wants to come in and just scare you with and, sh and tell you it's not going to work out and it's too impossible. And every time that fear, that panic starts to hit, I just start saying, Jesus, you are so much bigger than this. You are so much greater than this. And if we can keep that in the forefront of our minds, it helps keep our mind in the right place. And we can just, what God wants us to do is just to worship him through the, through the waiting process, through the period of the time where he's trying to do all the things behind our backs that we can't see. That's when we just stand up and we raise our hallelujah. And we are faithful to trust in him and to worship him through the process. So would you stand with us this morning? With me, I guess. <laughs> as uh, I'm not even standing, but I would like for you to stand <laughs> as we sing uh, our hallelujahs to the Lord this, this morning. It's louder than the voice of the enemy, and it's in the middle of our unbelief, and it's in the middle of the mystery. We're going to keep raising our hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. In the presence of my enemy, I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. In the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise. Death is defeated. The King is alive. Oh, and I raise a hallelujah. Everything inside of me, I raise a hallelujah, and I will watch the darkness flee. Yeah, I raise a hallelujah. Oh, in the middle of the mystery, that's when we praise you more. I raise a hallelujah. Cause fear you have no hold on me And I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar And up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The King is alive We're gonna sing a little louder, sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder, sing a little louder. Come on and sing a little louder, sing a little louder. Oh, come on, sing a little louder, sing a little louder, and sing a little louder in the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder, louder. Sing a little louder, my weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder, heaven comes to fight for me, yeah. You notice that sometimes when we're in a funk and we just start praising, our face starts to rise. So we're going to do that again. We're going to sing a little louder in the presence of the enemy because he has to flee and our faith is going to rise. We sing a little louder in the presence enemies sing a little louder louder than the unbelief and sing a little louder my weapon is a melody sing a little louder heaven comes to fight for me sing a little louder and i'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar Hope will arise, death is defeated, and the King is alive. 
in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise. Death is defeated and the King is alive. I raise a hallelujah. two things that I've been reminded of lately is that God is good and God is faithful. And there's nothing that can separate us from his love or his faithfulness or his goodness. So let's focus on his goodness this morning and just worship him for who he is. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days have been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my so, so good yeah. with every breath that I am able. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. I love your voice. Because you have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. Yes, you have. And all my life you have been so, so good. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, His goodness is running after us. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you running after, running after me. Let's sing that again. Your goodness is running. Your goodness is running after, running after me. And your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Yeah, yeah. Your goodness is running after So my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good yeah. With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Sing all my life you've been faithful And all my life you have been faithful Yes, you have, God. All my life you have been so, so good, yeah. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Yes, I will sing of the goodness of God. And I'm going to sing 
to prove you were for us, Jesus, my Jesus. It's extravagant, it doesn't make sense, I'll never comprehend the way you love us, it's unthinkable, only heaven just how far you'd go to say you love us, to say you love us, to say you love us. And you don't belittle our pain or our suffering. You comfort us in our greatest unraveling Jesus my Jesus you are the dawn that is breaking within me you are the sun that is rising around me Jesus oh my Jesus it's extravagant it doesn't make sense, we'll never comprehend the way you love us. It's unthinkable, only heaven knows just how far you'd go. all my love here is all my love it's yours no conditions when you pull me close no i won't resist here is all my love it's yours no conditions when you pull me close no i won't resist here is all my love it's yours when you pull me close, no, I won't resist. No, I won't resist. It's extravagant. It doesn't make sense. I'll never comprehend the way you it's unthinkable, only heaven knows just how far you'd go. didn't even spare your only son to say you love us. He took the death we should have died to say you love us. Your love is so deep and wide. You say you love us. Oh, to say you love us.
may be seated. You know, we've already had a little bit of time announcements this morning. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. Um, so for some of you uh, who are a permanent party and been here for a little while, you say, who is this guy up front now? Um, my name is Scott Kuman. I'm the new garrison chaplain here, and it's a pleasure. Uh, basically, all of us here this morning fall into one of two camps. We're either permanent party and been here for a day or two, uh, or um, you're, uh, you're new and just arriving. Well, we've been here for, uh, my wife and I have been here for a week and a half, so uh, we, we know the, the feeling and the pain of moving, as we all do in the military, right? Um, and we, go one, we take it one step further. We do it full ditty every time, so um, we like to be glutton for punishment. So um, before we go into a time of prayer, I just thought I'd just share a few things. I want you to know right up front, um, if you're visiting with us this morning and you're still, uh, you know, of course, doing, making your assessment, uh, that the two things that matter to us most in this service is, first off, that we glorify Christ Jesus. He is our sacred head, and we aim to glorify him and him alone because he's the only one worthy of our praise. Amen? And secondly, to build the fellowship of the body. That's you, us. And doing so together, connecting in relationship, in fellowship, in worship, in community, in all that that entails matters to us passionately uh, so that you can be fed and built up. Some of us coming in here are coming in on a wing and a prayer and barely survived the last operational unit we just came from. Some of us are coming in here and, um, you know, just reorienting ourselves, whatever it is. We want to help you. We want to be a part of, uh, part of building up and strengthening and encouraging, and we look forward to getting to know you and as part of the body. With that, um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanks. For you alone are our God. You are the one who has created us. You are the one who has redeemed us. You sustain us. You are the one who has promised not only to be, uh, to be there when we are in a time of need, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You alone are worthy to be praised and glorified and worshipped. And as all the elders surrounding your throne cast their crowns and worship you, and as all of the creatures surrounding you cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Lord, we find our identity and our purpose in you not the world. And we praise you. We thank you for all that you have done. And we look forward. We look forward with great anticipation when you return. Because we know that on your thigh it is written, King of kings and Lord of lords, and that your robe is dripped in blood, and you are victorious. We serve you and you alone. And Lord, we recognize the moment we, we look and we, and we reflect on your word and we behold the glory that is yours, that much like Isaiah, we become aware of our own, our own brokenness, our own sin, and we say, woe unto me, for I am a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips. Lord, we ask that you would that you'd forgive us. Each and every one of us, Lord, we know we, we, we fail. And we confess that. And we spend just even a moment now, silently, just to, to bring things to you that only you know. Lord, you know our sin, and we know 
that we can come and bring our sin to you because we also know that you are our loving Father. And by the blood and the atonement of Christ Jesus and all that he accomplished on the cross, you, Lord Jesus, our Savior, you are the one who forgives us and you are faithful and just and you promise and you do, you forgive us when we confess and so we thank you that we have that assurance, that hope, that, that certainty that we can be, that we are cleansed by you. We give you thanks for hearing our prayers. We give you thanks for watching over. We give you thanks for, for watching over our travels and getting here for those of us who've been traveling. We thank you for hearing our prayers as we lift up the needs of our families, the needs of our friends, and perhaps even our own needs that may be going on that we bring before you. We know, Lord, that as followers of Christ Jesus, that life in this world is not easy. There's no guarantees and no promises. We as believers aren't spared from no more from bullets than we are from all the other things that can claim our health and our lives. And we partner, Lord, we, we lift up those physical concerns too that might be troubling us or a family member. And we ask for your healing. We ask for your, your strength and encouragement. And Lord Jesus, we lay our requests before you because we know you hear us. And we pray that you would strengthen us, open up our eyes and our ears to hear and to see more acutely, more accurately, you, you, the word who became flesh and dwelt among us to see you and the truth of your word and to know you. Lord, help us to grow and not be, not be complacent. And for each of our CGSC students and whatever other uh, education is going on across this post, Lord, even though learning tactics is so critical and learning how to to work in a joint environment is so critical to the security of our nation, of our military. Lord, help us also to keep our eyes fixed on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And I pray, Lord, we pray that you will strengthen us and grow us into your body that represents and reflects you to this world and to the community we live in, to the soldiers and the airmen and the sailors and the Marines that we interact with, that we may be lights in a dark world for your glory, that you would be praised. I thank you now in this time. Amen. At this time, if our, our ushers come forward for tithes and offering. Just going to lift this up in a matter of prayer as well. Join, join me as we pray for our tithes and offerings. Lord, you have given so much to us, and we just simply want to return what is yours as we are stewards of what you have given. May we uh, give as you have given generously. May you bless this tithe, these tithes and offerings for your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Here in just a moment after the tithes and offerings are collected, uh, our, children's, our children's church, ages four through fifth grade, will depart in the back of the room with Keith in the uh, pink shirt there and Carl in the green shirt. I think that's green, right, Carl? Green. green. <laughs> From here, from this perspective, the pews are green. Everything is green. <laughs> so Keith and Carl, thank you very much. And with that, we welcome our pastor this morning, Chaplain Joel Kelly. All right, can you guys, whoa, turn down just a little bit. Hey, Pat, just a little bit. All right, 
Well, we are going to continue this morning along the lines of our new sermon series called uh, God Saves. Uh, last week we talked about, for those who aren't here, and for those who don't know me, I should probably introduce myself. My name is uh, Chaplain Joel Kelly. You guys can call me Joel or Skippy or whatever you guys want to call me. Um, I've been here for about a year and a half, and so I have to say that it's super awesome to see folks back in chapel. There for a while we were pretty, uh, pretty light. Uh, and because COVID has made some things d difficult, as we, as we know, but it's great to see you all here. Um, if you haven't met me yet, uh, please come up afterwards or something, and I'll find you or whatever, and I'll shake your hand real quick. I am one pastor of about three that uh, currently serve in this con congregation, this Pathway community. So it really is great to see you all here this morning. Uh, like I said, we are continuing in our study and the story about how God saves us, right? Uh, last week, if you weren't here, we talked about, and this is just me, and maybe you're different, but I love a good story. I don't love reading. It's weird, I know, but I do love a great story. That's probably why I don't like to read, because I have high expectations for a story, right? I need to feel some dramas. I need to see some action, some romance. I need all those things combined together to make a really great story. Um, that is important for me, especially when I know the story somehow involves God somewhere in it, like uh, Narnia or Lord of the Rings or something like that. That's what I need for me to have a great story. And when I think about our relationship to Christ, it is like a great story that you don't ever really want to put down, right? And so last week we talked about the, the beginning of our story starts with creation in Genesis 1-1, right? God created the earth and the heavens and everything in it. That was our beginning, and then we learned that God put it all on, on a timeline through the first day when he created day and night. So God has a beginning of which he creates all things. And then there's this timeline that will stretch all the way down until the end when God says, you know what? The earth is good now. I'm going to fold it back up and it, it is all over, right? And along that timeline, we exist. And we talked about how God formed the earth out of nothing. It was void. It had no purpose. It had no meaning, right? He formed it. He put the oceans, the dry land, and the animals, and the vegetables. He put all of that stuff, right, in our planet. It's this little tiny ball of light that spins around, and there's a big ball of light that spins around in a galaxy. And we're not even the center of the galaxy. We're just a part of the galaxy. But God so loved his creation that he created this wonderful thing out of nothing, and we talked about how the Jewish mind, it's not about the material or it doesn't, it doesn't matter the, the length that it took. What matters most is that God was the one that created it. He formed something out of chaos. And that's how the Jewish mind would have seen it. They would have seen this, understood this void of nothingness. And God just takes it and makes this amazing thing called the earth. And so our timeline begins with God creating something for us to exist in. For us to experience God along this line of time in a relationship with him. We are created to have relationship with God. That is why we're here. That is our function. That is our perfect. That is our, our reason for being our purpose. And everything else, the moon, the stars, the ocean, your dog, it's all, it all enables us to have this amazing relationship with our creator, who is God. So the story starts there. And along this storyline, we're going to have battles and love. We're going to have regrets. We're going to have failures and successes. And next week when uh, Chaplain Kuhnman gets up and preaches, he's going to talk about the first part where we really need saved in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, but we're going to talk about how God saved us along this timeline. And so we're going to continue today in the book of John, John chapter 1. It's going to kind of go along this lines of creation. Uh, so verse, verse there for me, pal. Before we read, though, let me say a quick prayer for today. Lord, thank you that you're here with us. Thank you that we're learning from your word. And God, your word is this amazing a thing that you preserved over time so that we could learn not just about a people that ex first experienced you many years ago, but how we even experience you today, that you preserved this word for us so that we can grow and learn and that as we experience you together, Father, in the context of community, you know, ironing, sharpening, ironing, this word helps us illuminate that relationship to you. 
And above everything else, Father, no matter how good we are at being a soldier, a retiree, a teacher, a stay-at-home mom, or whatever it is, God, we do, we, we first look to you, that you are our center, that you are our everything, that we're only those things because you first make us an amazing creation that you are making us, Father. Amen and amen. All right, so let's get into the first verse here. I don't like to carry things around, so I'm just going to read from the screen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. So there's some weird Greek there, but anything that was made was made. So nothing is made without him. So this kind of gets back to Genesis 1.1, right? When in the beginning, God created all things, the heavens and the earth. And John here is going to expand that idea. Let me explain to you for a second why that's important. So John the disciple is the author of this particular book, the Gospel of John. There are four Gospels, right? Matthew, Luke, Lark, Mark, Lark, Mark, and John. Uh, and this is John. John is a very close disciple of Jesus. Uh, most scholars, Bible guys, tend to think that John here was young during the actual time of Jesus, but John also lives the longest. He lives well into his 90s, even perhaps as old as 120. He's an old guy at some point. And scholars aren't exactly sure when John wrote this. Uh, it could have been later in life or it could have been very early. It really honestly doesn't matter because these words are amazingly awe-inspiring. And remember that John is a commoner. He's, he's, he probably knows some Greek. He probably knows how to do some Latin. He probably knows Hebrew to some level, but he's not a Bible scholar. He is the son of Zebedee, the brother of James, the disciple of Jesus, right? But it is also the same John that experienced the, the ministry of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. He experienced the coming of the Holy Spirit. He experienced the growth of the church. He experienced the death of Paul and Peter. So he's seen the church grow. He's seen it become this rather large, multicultural community of believers trying to follow after Christ. And John, just like all great writers, has a couple of themes. Uh, the first theme is Christ is the center of everything. His theology, John's theology, is very Christ-centered. Then he'll talk about the light in the dark. He'll talk about how the Jewish nation should have understood this is who Jesus is, but they failed. And so our first theme today is talking about this idea of the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. This has a significant meaning. I know it sounds simple, perhaps, when you read it, and we all understand, well, John's talking about Jesus, but this idea of the Word, in Greek it's called logos. It's got a much deeper meaning. So if you want to hit the next one for me, pal. All right, so logos, what does it mean? In the Jewish mindset during this time, Logos, God's word, his spoken word is sort of like God's imminent creative power at work in the world. So from the beginning, we had creation when God took nothing and made it into something, right? Made the animals, the vegetables. He made the, the, the mountains, the oceans, the seas, all that stuff, right? That is God's creative work in the world. That is God's spoken word. He spoke and those things came to be. So in the Jewish mind, right? Since the beginning of time, when God first made that little ball of light spin around the sun and the sun around, the, around our galaxy, that is God's creative work, his logos in the world. And we are a part of that. So from the beginning of time, God's creative work has been at work since the beginning. And John expands this idea that in the beginning, the way that God did this was through Jesus. Jesus is that creative power that God used, that God is working in our world. And the reason why this is so significant is because Jesus is the one that we're supposed to have a relationship with. Our whole purpose of creating us, our, our reason for being is to be in right relationship with the Logos, who is Jesus. And so John here is not going to pull any punches. He's going to come out swinging saying, this Jesus is the same God. He is the same creative power that's been existing since the beginning. It's Jesus. That's who this Jesus is. 
And then John's going to go further into the gospel and prove it time and time again with miracles, signs, and wonders. Jesus walking on water. He's going to prove, he's going to say to this Jewish nation that he's writing to, hey, this is how I know it's true because this is what Jesus did, as you all have heard. So from the outright, Paul or John's thinking it's very, very clear that this Jesus was there from the beginning. And that the way that we experience relationship with God is through Jesus. That's why Jesus will say time and time again, you can't get to the Father unless you go through me. And this is the first sign that really we hear about the Trinity. I mean, it's kind of in the other gospels and Paul addresses it here and there. Uh, but this is the first time it's really clear that there's this thing, the Godhead. And that part of his creation story for us is how he created the world and everything in it through Jesus. That is our story. That is where it begins. It begins with Jesus. And oftentimes when we think about creation, we, we still sometimes get lost in the, well, God did it in 24 hours or whatever, whatever. God made us matter by doing this. That part of it doesn't matter nearly as much as knowing that in the beginning was God. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was Christ himself, who, which, by which God created all things. And that is our vehicle for relationship to God. That is what makes Christ Lord. That is, make, that is what makes Christ like him. So it's absolutely true. What God does is what the Logos does. Jesus, who God is, is who the Logos is. And so John is going to hammer this point home very, very clear. All right, let's go to the next verse. So uh, verse four, we have this. In him was life, and life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Here's another theme in John. So John is really, and this is, this is, uh, this is mostly a Jewish thing. Uh, sometimes we as Americans don't really catch it as well. But for them, the light in the dark has significant meaning in life, right? The good things, Christ himself, light, shedding light on darkness. Uh, in the darkness, that's where the demons come out. You know, in the depths of the ocean where it's always dark, that's where bad things come out of. Um, it may sound a little bit superstitious to you, but for them, the, the darkness is that place where God doesn't really, not, it's not that God doesn't exist there, but it, it, it's a place where God doesn't have much purpose in, right? The things that don't have purpose, the things that have walked away from their purpose within God becomes that darkness, right? And in this early creation story, when God separates the light from the dark, it was never about good versus evil or this cosmic power. It's, it simply means that in that darkness, it has no purpose, and Chapman Kuman next week will talk a lot about sin. Sin in our life serves no purpose, right? It doesn't. It only distracts us. It only takes us away from that relationship. And so the Jewish mindset understands that where there are dark things, it's taking us. It is forcing us away from where we're really truly supposed to be in right relationship to Jesus. And so in this theme in John, he's always going to talk about the light versus the dark. And it's not about an issue of evil versus good, because Christ is going to overcome the good, right? Christ is going to do that. He separated the light from the dark. He separated the chaos from order through creation. So Christ is going to do this thing. But really what he's saying is, hey, look, followers of Jesus are going to be a part of this light. This light exists. That's who Jesus is. And the darkness will not overcome it. All right, let's go to the next verse. There was a man sent from God. His name was John. He came as a light as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. And he was not the light himself, but came to bear witness about the light. So who is this John? So if you've ever done any kind of Bible study, you know that this is referring to John the Baptist. Um, just before Jesus had arrived on the scene, there was a man named John the Baptist who was a cousin of Jesus. He was a relative of Jesus. And this was the man who was chosen by function to kind of pave the way for the Messiah to come. He was the one out in the wilderness crying, hey, get yourselves right because the Messiah is coming. And up until this point, there were some folks who thought maybe John the Baptist was the Messiah. But John here makes it very clear, no, that guy wasn't the, the Messiah. It was, it was Jesus. Um, so that's why sometimes scholars think maybe this is written a bit earlier. Because by the time John's an older guy, surely they, people wouldn't be caught, caught up on this. But um, just for the sake, that's why John says... John is not the guy who was, John the Baptist was not the guy. Um, he only came to bear witness about the light. Um, 
as the church is growing, and this is an early young church, they're, they're walking through things that can make folks stumble, like uh, getting stuck up on who the Messiah is or you know, the Jewish mind that, uh, or the Greek mind that our flesh is bad. Uh, they're wrestling with these things. And so uh, John is no, no less doing the same thing. All right, let's go on to the next verse. And then he goes on to say this. The true light which gives light to, the, to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came into his own and his own people did not receive him. So this is another theme where, where John looks at Christ's ministry and he, he sees all right, so the Jewish nation didn't exactly receive their Messiah the way they should have. And it's a little bit ironic, and I think that's the point of the, sermon, the, 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 uh, the, the verses here, is that the creator that, of all things, right, the reason why we exist to have a relationship with God, Jesus, right, who, who God chose his own people, the Jewish nation, right, this Messiah who's, who was supposed to come and the whole reason for us to exist to has, have a relationship with God, he shows up on the scene and his own nation says, no, I'm good. No, I'm good, Jesus. And for John, he's always going to wrestle with this question. How could that be that our story starts with this loving creator who wants relationship with us, but then he actually comes and the nation says, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good, Jesus. I'm I'm good. You're not exactly what I was expecting. We wanted a king that would throw Rome down, right? They were not expecting this Messiah to come and do something absolutely amazing. Ransom himself on a cross for you and for I. That's not what they wanted. They wanted a conquering, a conquering savior so that they could have more power. And that certainly isn't why Jesus came because it's not about power. It's about relationship to our loving creator which is why we were created to start with. So this Jewish nation rejects it. And then he goes on to expand this idea here in the next set of verses. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them right to be children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So again, he's sort of kind of sticking his finger in the chest of the Jewish nation saying, but you know what? It doesn't matter, Jewish nation, because this is what happened. Everyone else, Jewish, Gentile, Greek, whatever, anybody who says they're going to follow after this one Messiah, whoever puts their faith and hope in them, one Messiah to die for them, to take upon himself their sin, they're the ones that become the children of God. This idea of a, this idea of a nation is, is always still there, right? But when it comes to following after the one true creator of all things, the one true Messiah, doesn't matter anymore. What matters most is if, are you willing to follow after Jesus? So even the Jews and the Gentiles, the hated Samaritans, whoever it is, they all became part of the children of God. Not born because of blood, because you're from a tribe of so-and-so or of the flesh, but because you simply decided, I am going to follow after this Messiah. He is the coming Messiah. He is the creator. He is the one that I am supposed to have right relationship with. The reason why I was created was to have relationship with this Messiah, who is Jesus. And then he goes on to say this in verse 14. And this right here, I think personally, is probably one of the most important verses in the entire Bible. There are some good ones out there, right? Some words of Paul is great. When Moses first discovers God's voice and God says, I am who I am, that's an important verse. Um, but this one here is critical for us to understand as believers. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the father full of grace and truth. And so God's word, his logos, his imminent power that created all things is and did become flesh. This wasn't like, oh, I believe he's this, so it's okay now, right? It's not some kind of intellectual Belief system, Jesus, the word became actual flesh and dwelt among us. The God of all things, of all creation, I'm not even gonna say he limited himself, but what I will say is he became man, human for us so that we in this relationship on this spinning little planet that spins around the sun, the sun spinning around the, the, the galaxy can experience relationship with our actual creator. This is why Jesus 
came to dwell among us so that we could experience, like on, the, on our earth, a relationship with God. Man becoming flesh, or Christ becoming flesh, God becoming flesh, the Logos becoming flesh. It is critical for us to understand that that is who Jesus is. Because that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to have a relationship with him. He walked with us. The only son from the father, full of grace and truth. And, I, and ironically, John here only uses this word grace a couple of times. He uses it here in the first, in the first chapter. It's a foreshadowing of this idea that eventually Christ will be rejected by his own people. Eventually Christ is going to go to the, to the cross and die for you and for me. This act of grace, this ultimate act of relationship, taking upon himself what we ourselves could not bear on the cross for us. A ransomed Savior. And if you think about how deep this thought is, right? That the creator of all things, heaven and earth, us, relationship, would actually dare to die, would actually dare to take upon that chaos of nothingness for us. You see, when I think about the darkness in life, when I think about sin and where it takes us, it reminds me of that, of that void, that place where God did not exist. Uh, where God, it's not that God didn't exist. What really matters is that there were, it had no purpose, right? And in death, in some ways, our purpose ends. But through Christ, our life continues. Our relationship with God continues. That was the whole point. And so it's so critical for us to understand that God would take upon himself chaos, death, sin for us. That's an amazing thought, that he would do that for us, a part of that relationship. So that makes our story so amazing that this Christ with God would do that for us. That's what makes it so critical for us as Christians, for us as believers. And there's no other faith that says the same thing. There's no other faith that can prove it. There's no other faith that has this important detail about us falling after God. And then he goes on to say this in verse uh, 6, 17. Yeah. For the law was given through Moses. Grace came, and truth came through Christ. No one has ever seen God. Only God, only God who is at the Father's side he has made him known. So he's talking about Jesus. When Jesus ascended, he's not the right hand of God. This is who Jesus is. Right? Um, this isn't to say that the law wasn't an act of grace because it, it, it was. But when Christ came, grace became, became this physical thing on the cross that we could rely on and trust on. Um, there, was grace, there was grace in the law. But when Christ came, the law became in us. It became real. It became something that we can trust and rely on and knowing that Christ took upon that sin and that punishment that really the only thing that's required of us now is to simply believe and follow. Another example here that John is, is not against the Jewish law. That's not the point of this verse. It's really a, uh, it's a, um, it serves the purpose of saying, hey, now that Christ is here, it's not that the law has passed away, but that the law is realized through Christ. The truth of it is realized through Christ. This right relationship with God. So kind of walking back a little bit, we have this wonderful God who created all things through Jesus. Uh, this little spinny ball of light that spins around the, the sun, that's spinning around the, in the galaxy. Uh, this was created for us to have a relationship with him. And this relationship was created by the work of the Logos, who is Jesus. And then this is where our timeline begins, where humanity experiences God until the very, very end. And so there are a couple of points I wanted to kind of make out before we close today. Can you go to the last slide for me, pal? There's a reality about this that I think we all should kind of contemplate as we go. The first one is the same power that created all things saved us from death. So the same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that worked in creation. It's the same power that dwells in us. 
And that's why your life is so significant and so unique and so special that when we take the moment to follow after Christ, that power that was there in the beginning is dwelling in us. That's what makes this timeline so unique and so special and so real and so valuable that we're actually living this right now with Christ. That power dwells in you. And I, I recognize that there are probably parts of your life that you feel are dark. There are probably parts of your life where you feel like, yeah, God may not be in that. That may not serve a purpose for me to experience God. You, you can call it darkness if you want. I, I think I would. I know that there are dark places that we tend to find ourselves in, but because of this wonderful living Christ who died for us, that, that darkness doesn't have a place in our life. That darkness doesn't have to exist anymore. That we can trust Christ with it because he's the one that overcame it. He saved us from that death. And I, I, don't, know what, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in a place where God has no purpose. That void, the emptiness of nothing. And the last point here is the same power that created all things lives in us. That is a remarkable statement that I, sometimes when I, when I even say it, it's like, oh my gosh, what does that even mean? What does that mean for Joel? That same power that created all things, the relationship that we have with God dwells in me. I, that, that is such a, an amazing thought. Um, and I want to encourage you this week to think about what that means. That in our, in our great, wonderful story of God from the beginning all the way to the end, that that creative power, that logos, actually dwells in me. That's an amazing thought. Not only that, but that God himself, Jesus himself, would die on a cross so that I could experience that, not, not just in the times where I feel like I'm in the dark place, but at all times, because he's with me, and that I don't have to go to that dark place. So that this story, this timeline, just is amazing. So consider that. Consider that you are more than just your job. You are more than just being a parent. You're more than just American citizen. And I take that seriously. I, I honestly wholeheartedly believe with our pathway vision and everything that we've talked about over the last few weeks, that this is what God is transforming us to be in light. And allow that to really burn in your heart. Let's pray. God, thank you that you love us, Father. Thank you that from the beginning, you designed us to have, have relationship with you. And that through your working power, your logos, your love for us, Father, for your creation, we can experience a life that's full of light. And that we can be just as in love with you as you are with us. God, in that your creation, you see us as lovely, you see us as good. Help us lean upon that. Help us understand every single day that the dark things that try to weave its way into our mind and heart, they serve no purpose. But Christ, you in our life is our only purpose to exist. And we can only be a great whatever unless we fully understand and latch upon that reality, Father, that you make us amazing, that you have made us amazing because of your love in us and for us. So I pray that you would uh, bless today as folks go about their Sunday, that you would birth in their minds and their hearts what it means that you, the God of all things dwells in us and the Holy Spirit's dwelling in us and, and you are making us like a light to the rest of the world, Father. In Christ's name, amen and amen. All right. Well, have a great week. We'll see you all here next week. Thanks.